Hello, welcome to River of Ideas. I'm Abby Moore, the Outreach Program Manager here at the MWMO, and today I'm here talking with Sarah Nassif. Sarah is an artist and botanist based in Minneapolis, and since 2021, she's been serving as the MWMO's artist in residence. Her weaving water workshops have engaged hundreds of visitors through hands-on indigo dyeing and fiber art making. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to ask you about your background and how you came to your career as an artist and educator. But first, I want to start with something that you often start workshops with, which is that you ask people to make themselves a name tag with their name and a body of water that is important to them for some reason or significant. So I thought I would start by just asking you about a body of water that's significant to you and why. Oh, wow. You know, so I, I love doing all those workshops because I can change it every time. It's hard to pick one. Yeah. But um, I grew up on uh, the Tualatin River in um, just south of Portland in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And that, that body of water is important to me. I used to float in a big tractor inner tube about a half a mile down the river, which seemed really far, right. <laughs> to my friend's house who lived on the river. And so I could literally travel to her house on an inner tube when I was in grade school. Oh, and, uh, so it always felt like a, a place to be free. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like that question, too, also, because I like to change my body of water. Um, and one thing that I think is interesting is, like, really pushing people to just think of a significant body of water. It doesn't have to be their favorite, but there's a lot of reasons that different bodies of water are significant for us. Well, and it helps you just think about your connection. I mean, right. sometimes we don't pay attention to things that are right in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. And or, you know, just just a layer deep in our memory. Right. And when you have space to think about something and re-envision it in a new way, it can, you know, have some fresh meaning to you. Yeah. So um, I would love it if you would share a little bit about sort of like the use of that strategy for having people write on their name tag. So usually it's just people write their first name and then the body of water. And there's not usually a formal... Um, moment when people share that stuff, but how, what do you, why do you like using that? Oh, you know, and that reminds me next time, I think I will have a formal moment. Sometimes okay. I forget. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, so one of the things about when people come together in a group and don't already know each other mm -hmm. is you need some kind of an icebreaker or something to help people connect without, you know, too much challenge. Right. And, um, you know, coming to Minnesota, I found the social landscape here really different from where I came from on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a little bit more reserved culture. And so um, I just like to give people something to use to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, who, you know, if you see somebody, if I see somebody in the group that has a Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. uh, written on their name tag, I love to know, like, what is your connection to the Pacific Ocean? That's what right. that's the ocean I used to go to growing up. Mm -hmm. Or is there a special lake I've never heard of in Minnesota? And why is that special to you? And tell me your story. And people, when they get an opportunity to share about themselves, it makes them feel special and good. Mm -hmm. And and so it's really to just set a social tone in um, any of my projects that is really important for doing anything after that. If people aren't comfortable and relaxed and kind of getting into a convivial feeling, mm -hmm. you know, it's a robotic exercise to gather and learn. Yeah. Yeah, I had a um, fun experience. I feel like it's a really cool way to see connections with people that you wouldn't expect. Or, you know, um, I last year was um, at one of our events and we had had people do that. And I saw that someone had Burntside Lake, which is a lake in northern Minnesota on their name tag. And that's probably like my favorite body of water. But I rarely choose that for my name tag. Um, anyway, I was it was super fun to just ask him about Burnside Lake and like, what do you do there? And what's your connection? And he'd been going there for his whole life, as have I. And it was just kind of a neat like, we don't know each other, but we have this common experience that's kind of just a neat connection to make and see the way a room of people has these sort of like interconnections. Totally. So you talked a little bit about that you're from the West Coast, but tell us a little bit about your background and where you come from and oh. how you came to be here. Well, um, I was actually born in Anchorage, Alaska. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. No. Yep. I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. And um, 
my parents had moved up there in the 60s and mm-hmm. um, and had four kids and I lived there until I was six. So mm-hmm. my grandparents, my mom's side is from Oregon and we moved back to the Portland area um, about 1979 and built a house as a family. Okay. <laughs> it was a project. Yeah. Um, but it was on two acres on a river mm-hmm. that was actually a junkyard, mind you. <laughs> we bought a junkyard. Really? Yes. And we remediated and cleared the, you know, everything that had been there before and, and built this house together. So I learned a lot huh. about being outside, working with my hands, yeah. lifting with your legs and not your back. <laughs> How old are you at this point? Oh, from about six to, er, six to nine years old. Wow. Somewhere in there. Okay. I mean, it was a family affair, both grandpas, everything. We mm. had the tractor and, you know, and one of the things we did was pick rocks. We had to pick rocks out of the dirt and then carry them down to reinforce the bank down by the river. Mm. But, um, you know, I grew up with this family of people who did things themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and you, if you didn't know how to do it, you could teach yourself to do it. And so my dad was an engineer. My mom was a dental hygienist. But... Um, both of them could make or do anything from food to build a house to make any outfit you can think of mm. to um, who knows. Anyway, so I grew up with the, that kind of a background and a lot of time in nature, which is really lucky. And my grandma, I have a lot of memories of walking on the beach and, and looking for sticks that looked like dog faces. This was <laughs> somehow... Mm. You know, so always looking at the environment around me and looking for beauty and looking for patterns and really enthusing about it in a way that as a family, you know, we, my mom grew roses and, you know, it was just part of my backdrop was mm-hmm. enthusing about nature. You know, my grandpa would find a, a, a log that a beaver had chewed and that would be like a thing to bring over and show the grandkids huh. and be excited about and and then put on your porch as a display item for however long. Right. So, so my family background really had a lot of um, fortunate time, and I was sort of one of the free-range kids mm-hmm. of the 70s. Um, and um, a really formative experience for me was in high school, where I was a, a volunteer junior counselor in a program called Multnomah County Outdoor School. Okay. And the best thing about this, other than getting out of school for two weeks a year to go Mm -hmm. live in the woods, (laughs) was being exposed to the most creative educators I've still to this day ever met. Yeah. And my job was simply as a clueless 14-year-old to take groups of sixth graders on hikes through the woods. Hmm. And I was given some simple cue cards to sort of do some storytelling and convey some lessons, but I could add all the creativity I wanted. Yeah. And this gave me a playground to experiment in and and be encouraged by. And and so I really fell in love with the natural world in high school through that program. And I um, learned a lot about plants, animals, water, and soil. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was always a creative person. I went off to college. I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be a... um, a teacher or an environmental scientist or an artist, I didn't really know. Yeah. And so I dabbled in a few different classes at Colorado College where Mm -hmm. you and I crossed paths Mm -hmm. unbeknownst to us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But at any rate, at a a certain point, it wasn't the college for me to stay at, and I transferred to the University of Washington. Okay. And I went to the art department and tried to find out how my art credits could transfer from Colorado. Mm Mm-hmm. And they said they won't. <laughs> and um, I wonder, do you know why? Just well, they, it was lineup. just the art program at the time. This is before the internet. You know, we're mm-hmm. in really a different art world model, I think, okay. that um, was a lot more about doing things certain ways or being able to be ready for the gallery showing or, you know, certain levels of quality. This. Yeah. So I was supposed to be able to draw a sneaker or something like that. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, that's just not my style. I don't mm-hmm. draw sneakers. Yeah. At any rate, it wasn't, I can't remember what the thing was, but I also felt just really unwelcome at the time huh. in the art department. And um, and I was reading Beatrix Potter's biography at the time. Um, there was a book that had just come out in the mid-90s called Beatrix Potter, A Victorian Naturalist. Huh. And I was putting two and two together about her. She was a childhood 
um, storybook right. writer that I, I mean, I loved the Beatrix Potter yeah, me too. Peter Rabbit books and the art in them. And, and I actually had a, a student or a teacher, like a, a teacher come into my grade school and teach us about her artistic style. And we hmm. all learned to draw like Beatrix Potter. Really? I don't even remember huh. how that came about. But that was sort of a, you know, one of those artists in, a, in the school's programs. Right. So, turns out she's more of a scientist, <laughs> yep. you know, than anything else, and um, and, a, and a botanist at that. Um, and so I thought, well, I don't know. I think I'm going to go check out the botany department. Hmm. And boy, I just found my people there. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. felt so at ease. It was sort of like grown up outdoor school in a mm -hmm. way. Um, and in so many ways, there were other people that that sort of had left the art department, so to speak, yeah, um, and found their way to botany. So there's yeah. this really interesting crossover in the world of people who like to sit around and look at plants, yeah, where um, there's a certain amount of creative observation that mm -hmm. is just part of your nature. Sure. And um, so you find this crossover of art and science in botany that's it's so closely intermingled. Mm -hmm. Because, um, for instance, in, in botany still... A photograph is not as useful as an illustration of a plant if you're trying to learn about its components. Sure. That makes sense. Because I guess you can really like emphasize the, in whatever, the different pieces or whatever you're trying to look at. Yeah. In a way that a photo can't necessarily capture as well. Exactly. Huh. So it's interesting. So, you know, fast forward, I, I get my degree in botany. I, I spend a little bit of time in Ireland studying Ooh, with nice. like tweed suited botany professor. Nice. It was amazing. <laughs> Learning a lot about seaweed mm -hmm. <laughs> and bogs yeah. and moss. Um, but I graduate and uh, my first job is uh, in the urban forestry department for the city of Bellevue. Okay. And um, this job, you know, I was just an assistant. I got, <laughs> I didn't get any health insurance or mm -hmm. anything, but mm -hmm. um, I helped bring the Urban Forest Conference to town, and I worked with citizens from around the community to connect with trees, basically. Yeah. You know, the, Bellevue is this beautiful suburb of, you know, generally uh, better off folks, and the Douglas fir trees were just getting too tall for hmm. some people. Hmm. They're pretty tall trees, yeah, right? right. But, you know. They're also like what the Northwest is. looks like. <laughs> But if it's blocking your view of yeah. Lake Sammamish, huh. you might not like them so much. Okay. But of course, if you start cutting them all down, you're going to have a different problem. Yeah. And so if the urban forest uh, forestry department um, was just a little subset of the parks department. And for the most part, it was in charge of taking care of street trees. Mm -hmm. But helping people learn about trees in their private property was sort of a new frontier in a way, you yeah. know? Yeah. Because of course, trees don't care who owns the property. Right. <laughs> you know, a forest is an ecosystem and even in an urban environment, a forest is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And um and so I developed an outreach program that was built on um this um desire to have a a tree survey, an urban forest tree survey. Okay. And we used citizens to do the surveying. Mm -hmm. So I just took groups of, of uh, residents out and showed them how to measure diameter at breast height mm -hmm. and um, identify, you know, what a Douglas fir cone looks like and, yep. um, you know, all kinds of things like that. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things I did was commission a scientific artist, illustrator, to help me design a localized field guide. Okay. Because... You know, it's a strange mix in the urban environment. Right. Are the trees, you know, they're partly native, they're partly, you know, ornamental. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, and that was just a really fun thing. And the response of the public was so exciting to me. I yeah. didn't, you know, realize that I was already doing my job then that I'm doing now, but it didn't add up at the time because yeah. of the lack well, of health insurance. What did you think of yourself as at that point? Or like what what would oh, you have said sort of my, my career is going to be? A naturalist. Okay. Same with me. Yeah. A naturalist. That mm -hmm. seemed like a good title. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, it was interesting to me because in, in my small department, not everybody was really tuned to do outreach mm -hmm. or to connect with people. You know, you could be a total expert about a scientific topic, 
but not really be comfortable around new people. Sure. And that's what I did Mm -hmm. just by um, naturally. you. By being me. Right. (laughs) So that was such a cool experience. But unfortunately at the time, you know, the internet was kind of starting to uh, grow and everybody around me was earning heaps of money and Mm -hmm. I was feeling foolish. And so I sort of cashed in my chips, so to speak, and (laughs) went to work as a... um, in the marketing department of a construction company where I helped a little bit with some of their green buildings okay. um, initia- initiatives. Mm-hmm. But that was for one year. And then I moved to Minneapolis. Okay. So how long have you been here? So since 2000. Okay. Yep. And uh, again, I moved here for a job. It was part of the internet bubble. I, mm. I never did really a speck of billable work, but I mm. was hired to a company for nine yeah. months and then it imploded and I had to get a new job. Um, and my last job interview was actually on September 11th, 2001. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. So the timing was pretty awful. And um, the, the job that I'd sort of distilled my best earning power into was data mm. analysis. Okay. I mean, I'd done so much with GIS and databases and, um, you know, collecting data. Yeah. <laughs> um, that that was kind of my, my best earning potential, so to speak. And there's a huge number of uh, agencies in town here that serve all kinds of, um, I'm getting off the topic here, but um, in town here, I went, I went to work for a company that processed all the data for like Northwest Airlines at the time and mm-hmm. Musicland and Best Buy, hmm. who should receive the next postcard in the mail. And there's a whole science behind that, huh. that at the time was still relatively new yeah. data informed marketing. Of course, now none of us can get away from it. Right. You know, but I, I was doing it kind of manually <laughs> interesting. with the actual database. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it wasn't great work for me. Ultimately, long term, it's stressful and not, not creative. And I just kind mm-hmm. of burned out of it um, right around the time that year or so after I got married and we wanted to have a family and working 70 hours a week mm-hmm. wasn't realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just left yeah, <laughs> and had no plan. Yeah. But I'd lived in Minnesota by then for five years and couldn't name a single tree. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, with my botany degree. Right, right. And just focused on other stuff. <laughs> totally, you know. And I hadn't met people that were part of the, like, right. outdoor world. I didn't really know where to go here. I mean, a lot of the outdoor culture in Minnesota at the time was more geared towards hunting and fishing, which mm-hmm. is not really my bag. I like to sure. hike. But, you know, when everything's flat, it's sort of hard to tell where to go hiking. Right. <laughs> so um, so anyway, uh, and, and I also had not done anything creative for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And I was so lucky. I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to move here was the number of artists that are in yeah. this town. And, I mean, just regular people with studios yeah. who have a job, but they also have a studio. It was amazing. Yeah. And I had friends that had a, a screen printing studio at the time, and I wanted to learn how to do that again. I'd done it a little in high school. Mm-hmm. And, and also at this time, I'd gotten a digital camera. Mm-hmm. And um, so I could start going out and taking pictures of plants. Yeah. And then go back to my computer with my stack of field guides mm-hmm. <laughs> that... You know, if you carry all the field guides you need in Minnesota, that backpack is very heavy. Mm-hmm. So um, so I start, my main goal was I need to learn the plants. This is just, you know, it's gone on long enough that I don't, I can't name a single tree. Yeah. And, um, and so I spent a lot of time taking these digital photos and trying to take pictures of the plant features that I could use to identify them when I got home. So a lot of times like a silhouette type of picture would be really useful. And... Or I'd be shooting up towards the sky or something. But then I was, I had a dream one night about turning one of these um, images, it was just Queen Anne's lace, Mm -hmm. um, into like a permanent corsage. One of the things I really missed about growing, when I moved here is fresh flowers. It's Mm -hmm. just harder to come by, you know, in the wintertime here. Growing up, we always had fresh flowers because we were growing them. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought, well, what if the flower bouquet could just be part of your outfit. Okay. And what if that design could tell you something about the plant? So really from about 2005 until 2012, I I had this botanically 
botanically inspired fashion hmm. company called. So like you're wearing like a field guide? Yeah, you're wearing a field guide. <laughs> totally. That was yeah. exactly it. That's cool. I was like environmental education through fashion. Yeah. Like how can I reach people in an unexpected place? Yeah. And um, and I had so much fun doing this, but it's pretty hard to make a buck in the fashion world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Making and selling, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a lot of labor and work. Mm-hmm. And when the economy sort of shifted and people wanted to pay me later, I realized that I was definitely in over my head unless I was ready to like go whole hog and do gift shows or something. Sure. And I didn't want to. So it was sort of go big or go home. And I went home. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I had spent six years developing all these botanical designs and these stories that went with them, and I had a lovely website, and I mm-hmm. had this opportunity to do a trunk show at the Walker Art Center okay. um, gallery, or excuse me, gift shop. And um, the best part of it <laughs> was talking to all the people that came to purchase, you know, mm-hmm. my scarves and bags mm-hmm. and T-shirts. And to talk to them about the plants and to help yeah. them make these connections. Mm-hmm. And of course, Queen Anne's lace is a great plant. But lot, you know, it's a common weed. Yeah. But it's something that a lot of people have childhood associations with if you sure. grew up with a story. So a friend of mine, um, Betsy McDermott Alzheimer, is mm-hmm. a is a um, a coach, <laughs> and she was just beginning at that time, or maybe she wasn't just beginning. But I met with her, and she said, "Well, what do you like to do all day long?" I said, I like to talk to people about plants. And so once I sort of closed up the rectangle design stuff, I started to go into more education projects and residencies mm-hmm. and so forth. So I became a compass artist. Okay. Um, and that gave me a chance to develop a project called the Urban Forest Project. Mm-hmm. Um, and Basically, it was teaching children how to look at trees, because mm-hmm. as I found out in my first iteration, they don't care what the name is, yeah. because they need to learn how to look at a tree. So for several years, I worked with kids just around how you use the five senses to observe nature, and how they're like superpowers, okay. and how the more you use them, the better they work, just mm-hmm. like muscles, mm-hmm. and that they can help you be your own teacher. And of course... Um, back to Beatrix Potter, she was self-educated because she was a Victorian female child Mm -hmm. and didn't go to school like her brother did. Mm -hmm. So she brought nature into her bedroom, Hmm. observed it, drew it, taught herself. Yeah. Um, And I had a second grade student one time say to me, I said, what did you learn today that you didn't know before? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, I didn't know I could be my own teacher. Really? Yes. (laughs) That's cool. I know. And I thought, well, that is a really important takeaway. If young kids, you know, kids that are born with Google (laughs) think that knowledge, I don't know, who can blame them? They think that knowledge exists in Google and you go find it. Yeah. It's not something you make yourself. Right. But of course it is. Right. In fact, it's really important that we practice making information together Mm -hmm. and sharing it and refining it and reformatting it and questioning it. Right. Um, Well, and just turning on your brain in all those ways so that you're paying attention to figure out what makes this different from this and how do I know that this is whatever plant I'm looking at. I feel like just those kinds of thinking skills are so important and easy to bypass when you're just used to being sort of fed information that you're supposed to remember and then regurgitate on a test or something like that. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. humans are built to connect I mean, yeah. or wired to connect. Yeah. And you know that one of my big shticks is thinking about this vagus nerve and the polyvagal theory and mm-hmm. how do people connect and why can they connect sometimes and not other times and, you know, how does your nervous system inform your behavior in ways that you can't necessarily control? Yeah. Um, and I thought those all became really interesting questions um, uh, over time. Um, but back to the um, the teaching stuff and, and the, tr- you know, teaching kids about trees and observing them. And then they would make their own leaf motifs. And then they would learn how to screen print with a little handmade screen printing tool they would make. Mm-hmm. And then we would go have some kind of a picnic or a happening of whatever type. So one time we went to the, the Walker um, Sculpture Garden and mm-hmm. sat in Fritz Haig's, um, or I can't remember what the name of the outdoor sculpture was, but it was like a circle of stumps you could sit on, and we had a tea oh, okay. party. It was cool. really awesome. Yeah. And um, 
And and everybody wore their T-shirts that they had designed and printed. Yeah. Of some kind of leaf motif. Um, and I loved this, but, you know, it's really hard <laughs> mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. And you don't have an assistant. <laughs> right. And also I was curious about where else I could take this. And uh, around that time, Springboard for the Arts. And mind you, still at this point in, in my journey, I didn't identify myself as an artist. What did you identify I mean, yourself I was as? A more designer. of a teacher? A designer. A, okay. Educator. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I said teaching artist. That was sort of a new word to me. I didn't know that was a thing yeah. until I was already doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is sort of a theme. So. Right. I mean, you have always been an artist, but you never really identified yourself as such until recently. Yes. Okay. And um, so in 2015 or 2014, um, the Green Line was uh, coming, mm-hmm. uh, getting built, and um, we had just bought a house in Prospect Park nearby the new train line. And um, Springboard for the Arts, which has been just like a major support for me along mm-hmm. the way in my art career, um, had a grant opportunity where the requirement was, do you think you're an artist? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then you qualify if you live in the zip code. Huh. <laughs> and, um, and so there was no resume required, which was really powerful for me because I didn't have one. Yeah. And I really wanted to take my, I was still really trying to learn about the landscapes of Minnesota because I didn't know the history. Mm-hmm. Like, what was this place before it was built? And that's when I... Um, um, proposed doing this project called the Other Green Line. And I wanted to know, 100 years ago, when the last train line was opening up, mm-hmm. I mean, the Green Line's not new. It used to be called the Interurban Line, and okay. it connected the two downtowns. In fact, the first version of it was horse-drawn train carts somehow. I can't imagine how it worked. <laughs> Did it go kind of in the same route? That same the route. the Green Line is on? Mm-hmm. That, I mean, it makes sense. That's yeah. interesting. Well, and that route is originally an ox cart trail Mm -hmm. Hmm. and that gets into a whole natural history of why we have twin cities you know that that saint paul was as far north as you could go by boat Mm -hmm. and you had to take your stuff off and put it on an ox cart if you were going to be sending it further north right um so i created this field guide that Mm -hmm. they funded i I don't know if we made three thousand copies of it Mm -hmm. um and i put them in little holders next to all the other free <laughs> paper-based merchant, you know, mm-hmm. freebies, free maps and brochures and things that convenience stores have by the checkout. Okay. And then I put mine there as well. And there was a pencil mm-hmm. and um, that said the other green line. And, and it was just free for people to take. Mm-hmm. And they could do a self-guided natural history tour based on the idea of what if, tra- what if train stations were trailheads? What if when you get off the, the, at the train stop... Yeah. You know, at um, at Prospect Park. Sure. What if you were going on a hike? Where would you go? Well, you might climb the nearby came. What mm-hmm. is a came? Oh, it's mm-hmm. a it's a glacial pile of gravel. Yeah. And it's so special that there's one there. Is that what the witch's hat is on? Yeah. Huh. You know, and really Minneapolis wouldn't be so flat. Yeah. If all of those beautiful hills of gravel weren't mined to build the city. Right. Oh. So, cool. You know, so I was interested in sort of uncovering these hidden in plain sight natural history stories that helped us understand where we are and mm-hmm. feel connected to the places that we are. Mm-hmm. And um, so I also did um, uh, kind of artist-led tours. So people could do it on their own. And then you could also um, sign up and um, you could also sign up and uh, and meet up with me in a small group for free. Okay. <laughs> and I would take you on the on the foray, as mm-hmm. they were each called a foray. Mm-hmm. And um, we'd talk about a certain theme. So I had a gravel one. I had one at East River Flats that was all about floodplain mm-hmm. um, and species and cottonwood trees and, you know, the, the Slovaks yeah. <laughs> and uh, Czech people that used to live down by the, by, uh, in the floodplain area, which that's my heritage. Okay. And so you were just doing all the research and putting this stuff together and then showing up and whoever yeah. showed up? got to learn from you. Exactly. Huh. Did you want to keep talking about Well, the what I want to say about the the, the other Green Line project mm-hmm. um, introduced me to all the other artists. And that was where things really changed for me oh. because I, at this point, had lived in Minneapolis for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And then I was really finally finding my community of people. Yeah. Um, 
who are this art and science mix mm -hmm. that are really interested in serving other people, in you know, caring for the environment, in trying to find creative ways to help people connect to it. Hmm. And I mean, this town is so rich in yeah. creativity to begin with, yeah. but especially in this kind of smaller universe of people working uh, to demystify natural systems, mm -hmm. demystify government systems, make things just a little more accessible for people. Right. Um, as a way of helping us all be better citizens, you mm -hmm. know, if you don't know anything and you have no access, how can you really feel capable or, you know, even like you have the right, <laughs> right. to have an opinion about something? And of course, the more that we can talk and share and learn, of course, hopefully the better job we can do around taking care of each other, taking care of the environment, um, you know, weathering all of the uncertainties that are mm -hmm barreling down on us all the time from pandemics to warm winters to, yeah, you know, all, all kinds of unexpected and unknown things. So, um, so you've talked a lot about sort of some of the illustration and that kind of art, but I, know, I think of you as a fiber artist. So where did that sort of <laughs> cross over? Well, or? this was what was so I, and maybe thanks for reminding me that because actually, I mean, the first thing that I ever did was I learned how to sew. Mm -hmm. and my mom taught me how to sew. I can remember sitting on her lap mm -hmm. and, um, and I mean, I sewed up a storm and, and Molly Ringwald oh, <laughs> and, yeah. and Pretty in Pink. That was just perfect timing for mm -hmm. me because boy, I sewed a lot of my own clothes in junior high. Yeah. And, um, we, uh, so, I mean, I love to make things. I love fabric. I love fibers. I love the information that's held in yarn and thread and pattern and print and mm. color. They just, for me and my family, it felt always felt like each tablecloth had some kind of significant story to share about it. Yeah. And um, when I moved to Minneapolis, you know, I moved away from all of my family and all of my roots. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the textiles I brought with me <laughs> were really important. Um, but I hadn't thought about and, and actually, that's also part of what I was doing with the Rectangle Designs Botanically Inspired Fashion was um, creating textiles that were significant and told you about a place mm -hmm. and helped create a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned to weave at Colorado College, actually. Do you remember the arts and crafts department there? They had this like vaguely. I was pretty it far away from it. it no, you were playing. <laughs> it was <TV>. geology. <laughs> um, well, they had this non-academic arts and crafts program with silversmithing and pottery and looms oh, and sewing. Yes, I made Fimo beads. Oh, cool! Fimo class and a jewelry class. I had totally forgotten about that until this moment. They even had glass blowing there. Yeah, or something. Yeah, torch I work. Yeah, I remember that. Now that you say that, gosh, that's so funny. Well, that was my favorite my place, memory. and uh -huh. I got to use everything for free because I rehabilitated the sewing machines and taught oh, nice. all the snowboarders how to make you know, modify their backpacks so they mm -hmm. can carry their snowboards in the ah, backcountry. Ah, cool. Yeah, it was really great. But um, they had looms there, and that, that's where I learned how to weave. And at the time, I had um, woven these rag rugs out of old polyester pants that were, you know, hmm. really easy to come by at the Goodwill at the yeah. time, as everybody's <laughs> grandma's of a certain age. <laughs> in that era, you know, there was a lot of polyester left over from the 70s showing up in, yeah. in the Goodwill. And so I used those and, and wove rag rugs and I, you know, with the bright colors and they were very durable. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, but of course a loom is like not portable. Right. <laughs> I mean, that kind of loom, a right. floor loom. And so I really never wove again uh, until my daughter took a class at the Textile Center mm -hmm. from Chiaki O'Brien, who's a local fiber artist and Saori weaver, mm -hmm. which is a specialized type of free weaving that is used, use a, that uses a specially designed loom, which mm -hmm. is the one that I have in my Weaving Water Project, mm -hmm. um, that folds up like a folding chair mm -hmm. and pops open and you can just sit down and, and weave easily with it. It doesn't involve the weaver necessarily even having to thread the thing. Okay. You know, you could just sit down and experience weaving. And my daughter came home from the first day of camp with about 10 feet of cloth she had woven. <laughs> it's like, how the heck did you do that in yeah. one day? Yeah. I got to see this thing. And so um, 
that was the first state arts board grant that I wrote mm -hmm. and received um, because I wanted to mentor with Chiaki. I wanted to buy a loom. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see where weaving could take me. I wanted to reteach myself how to do it. Mm -hmm. And because for the grant, of course, you know, I needed to have sort of a project in mind, I yeah. thought, and I'm a sucker for alliteration. <laughs> I thought, well, what if it was a weaving water project? You know, I've done all this work with trees up to now. Mm -hmm. But what about people connecting with water? It's kind of a big deal. And yeah. I was really inspired by, um, you know, Shanae and Colin's work with the water bar. Mm -hmm. And um, just seemed like a really great next step for me. And it yeah. all kind of crystallized and came together. And ultimately, I, I was able to um, demo or prototype the project up at North House Folk School mm -hmm. on the shore of Lake Superior mm -hmm. at their Youth and Family Weekend, okay. which is over the MEA weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the first time I kind of rolled that out completely um, with the loom, with uh, indigo dye, mm -hmm. with using the lake water as the wedding agent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to dye with indigo, you have to take and wet your cloth first before you put it into the indigo. Mm -hmm. And it was just a blast. Yeah. And it was so intergenerational because, you know, grandparents bring their kids up to North House. And um, so I was really trying to engage everybody that mm -hmm. showed up. Mm -hmm. And we ended up weaving quite a bit of cloth that was really cool looking. And, yeah. you know, just the, the looks on kids' faces and you know, or adults who really insisted that they would only watch. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, just sit down for a second and give it a try. Yeah. And people will sit at the loom and literally send the shuttle left and right, look up and say, that is the most relaxing thing I've ever done yeah, in my whole life. I've heard that a lot of times from people who would just sit down at the loom for a minute. It's like, mm -hmm. what is that doing? Mm -hmm. You know, you've been there for four seconds and yeah. this is that profound to you? Yeah. So it started making me really think about our connections with textiles. Mm -hmm. And also part of the project was to help us think about our connections with textiles as a way that we connect with water. I mean, so often when we think about water and water quality, we're thinking about drinking water. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's an important part of the story. Right. But... Um, you know, it's not the whole story. And, you know, every aspect of making cloth involves vast quantities of water. Mm -hmm. The textile industry is one of the biggest polluters right. on earth. And at this stage of the game, it's so complicated and so complex mm -hmm. um, that it's really hard to regulate. You know, even just, I was just reading something um, about even trying to trace organic cotton or, or the source of cotton. Yeah. You know, because of Everything from where it's grown to where it's processed to, you know, it just gets sent around the globe. Mm -hmm. And so you might know where it got finished, but you don't necessarily know the origin story and things get mixed along the way. So, um, so the, but the Weaving Water Project primarily was about putting people physically in the, in the weaver's seat mm -hmm. and reminding us that this amazing, complicated machinery Mm -hmm. a loom, mm -hmm. wasn't invented by any one culture. Every culture invented it. Mm. You know, it's so inspiring to me because like a lot of technologies, it was, you know, like China invited, excuse me, China invented um, screen printing. You know, they had a silk industry and they developed yeah. this technology and it went around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Weaving, every culture has a version of weaving. Mm -hmm. They have different tools that have been created to weave in different ways. They have different patterns that have been developed to reflect whatever um, cultural values or the yeah. environment <laughs> where, they, where they live. Um, and then I think it's also interesting that people found this profound relaxation instantly when they sat down and did the shuttle pass. Um, because we're so highly stressed, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and this is still all before the pandemic. Right. But I was just fascinated with that because I'm, I'm sensitive to stress mm -hmm. <laughs> myself. I mean, who isn't? But I, I found that to be a major limiting factor over the course of my life. And I really try to design my life to limit stress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was amazed when people would sit down mm -hmm. and at the loom and announce how relaxed they were after four seconds of weaving. Mm -hmm. And, and this just made it really stuck in my mind because I'm interested in how do we 
get over our stress responses, you know? Mm -hmm. So many of us are stressed constantly, yeah. and now our world is just more stressful than ever, and computers are very big stress inducers. For sure. And I thought the fascinating thing was is that the computer is actually based on the loom, mm -hmm. which I just think is an interesting little tidbit. Mm -hmm. As everybody wanders around with their smartphone to encounter a loom mm -hmm. and to make that connection is sort of an interesting talking point. Um, but, and then indigo as well. So we have the weaving technology that is totally complicated and you know, every culture developed mm -hmm. around the world. And then you have indigo. Indigo is this totally unique chemistry when it comes to fabric dyes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't function the way that most other dyes function. Um, it doesn't need a mordant, for in instance, which is a special kind of pretreatment of fabric to make the dye stick or stay. Right. Or the dye be fast, as they say. And indigo... Um, comes from a variety of plants. Mm -hmm. It's not just one plant. Yeah. You know, and these so plants are from different plant families, mm -hmm. which I think is fascinating. You've mm -hmm. got indigo from the pea family. You've got, you know, woad, which is the kind of the weaker version of an indigo plant that grew in Europe, is from the cabbage family. Hmm. Um, the indigo that I'm growing in Northfield with Judy Say Wellis and um, the Rice County Indigo Collab Collaborative, what are we calling ourselves? The Rice County... Indigo Collective. Okay. <laughs> well, we've been growing it down there um, at a farm. Is Japanese indigo, and it's mm -hmm. related to buckwheat. Oh, that's right. But most of these plants don't look like much themselves, mm -hmm. and yet they contain this blue mm -hmm. pigment. But, of course, to extract it is this massively complicated process. Mm -hmm. And once you do extract it, um, you have this blue pigment that actually is not soluble in water. You can't just stir the blue powder into the water, like, right. and have it dissolve. Right. It stays suspended unless you change the water composition mm -hmm. by adding fruit sugar or fructose and, um, and something to help uh, lower the pH. Mm -hmm. Raise the pH? Why do I not know how to say remember. that? <laughs> you have to add a fruit sugar and a base to change the pH up to about 11. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, once those two things happen, what happens is that the oxygen in the water is taken up mm -hmm. and allows the blue indigo molecule to transform into what is called leuco indigo or white indigo. Mm -hmm. And so an indigo vat actually looks sort of, if you look at it through a jar, it looks kind of yellowish or reddish. Yeah. It doesn't look blue except on the top where it's interacting with the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so that's called an oxygen re reduction reaction. Mm -hmm. And so... Okay, it's really complicated, right? Again, all cultures around the world that had access to indigo-bearing plants figured this chemistry out. Mm -hmm. And chemistry wasn't really a thing until the 18, late 1800s, you know? Yeah. Um, so I find that amazing, too. So between weaving and indigo, there's ample proof that human beings are creative. Mm -hmm. We do complicated things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that nobody's in charge of figuring everything out. Yep. That, every, you know, that there is something about the collective that is also required in both processes. Like mm -hmm. a single person can't necessarily do everything involved to make cloth. Right. You've got to spin thread. You've got somebody's got to raise that fiber. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. both of the processes are very collaborative and community oriented. And then they both lend themselves to conversations about water. Um, in the case of indigo, you know, most people are going to turn their brains off the minute you start talking about water chemistry and dissolved oxygen. Mm -hmm. It just sort of makes you want to, I mean, unless you're already unless into you're that into stuff. Or whatever, <laughs> sure. You know, mm -hmm. it's not widely accessible language, yeah. I, yeah. let's just say. But, um, you know, when you look at something closely and you work with it with your hands in a creative way, it mm -hmm. transforms and it allows you to notice it in your own world fresh in yeah. a way. And actually, I just experienced this with the, um, the salt, um, the, the art and science on the river, mm -hmm. the, the first one that Kim and Annie um, put on. And I am seeing road salt everywhere yeah. now. It's, it's awesome. not that I never I mean, noticed awesome it. It's awesome and terrible at the same time. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, we painted yeah. and used those salt crystals that Annie had collected in a parking lot. Yep. And it just, it, it's like it 
removes the veil mm -hmm. or it, it allows you to focus on something that's right in front of your nose, but you have filtered out so many times that you don't see it anymore. Right. And I think that's really what the main thing is about bringing mm -hmm. art to people in yeah. places like Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, where you wouldn't think, oh, yeah, that's a hotbed of art. Right. You know? Even though it kind of is. Even though it totally <laughs> is, which is why I wrote you into that yeah. second grant in yeah. 2020 yeah. to do the second iteration of Weaving Water. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I had so much fun with that first iteration in 2018. I got mm -hmm. the loom, I tried it out, and I just wanted to do more. Yeah. And at the time... Um, I had never had a solo show, which of course is sort of a, a career marker right. for artists. Right. <laughs> and, and in general, like, I, I, I'd had one show, a, a group show, mm -hmm. um, that was part of the Textile Center, um, the Jerome, anyway, that was another thing. Yeah. But I I'd, I'd just had that one experience, even learning how to hang something up appropriately sure. and make a label for it. Sure. Um, so I thought that would be a really great challenge, and this would be such a great space yeah. because it felt like warm and accessible, mm -hmm. and like not as likely to sort of do the rejection right. <laughs> feeling that I got back at the art department at UW. Yeah. Um, so it just seemed great, and I was very excited to like take my weaving to another level, and I explored the Theo Mormon. Um, inlay technique in which mm. I was going to weave the actual watershed shapes of right. three watersheds right. that I would choose based on right. my life experience. Yeah. And these, you know, I didn't know exactly where it would go, but I was envisioning, you know, five foot by eight foot weavings that mm -hmm. I would make on these looms at the Weaver's Guild, which was right. just down the block from me. And I went as far as getting some of the materials and learning how to do a little bit of this technique, which was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do three watersheds. Might be lucky to get one done. But um, right around when I was starting to learn how to do all that, the pandemic hit. Yeah. So I want to just explain a little bit about yeah. how you and I had initially connected about you wanting to do this solo show here. So at the MWMO, we used to have, or our, our previous model of having arts engaged outreach um, and working with artists was that we had gallery shows in our lobby downstairs. Um, artists usually had their work up for three to six months. Um, they would do some amount of community engagement to allow people to come in from the public to learn from the artists about what they'd been doing. Um, and all the art had some sort of connection with water off in the Mississippi River um, and had sort of a stewardship uh, leaning to it. Um, and so you were going to come in in that model and the plan was to have you have your show and to also do some community weaving together to produce pieces. And, and so we were just queuing that up and getting it ready to roll in the summer of 2020 when, and then it was that spring that everything shut down. So you and I were able to stay in touch and kind of keep kicking the can down the road. And then we finally in 2021, said we need to we need to do something um and uh but everything had shifted in so many ways so we um kind of re-envisioned you still were going to do your solo show and um but we were rethinking the community engagement for a million reasons including the fact that people still weren't really gathering in significant groups definitely not usually indoors. And so we ended up hosting um, our, the first Weaving Water workshop as part of your residency here at the MWMO in October of 2021. Um, and it was a really sort of magical experience. So do you want to talk about that oh boy. workshop? <laughs> well, I was so glad we, we stayed in touch throughout mm -hmm. all the pandemic ups and downs. And I mean, it really was, it was really just the hardest time. Yeah. Um, especially here in Minneapolis. Um, but I was glad we, we kept in touch throughout the pandemic and we kept looking for an opening. Like I kept saying, well, do you think you guys are going to reopen in June or, right. or maybe August? Okay. October. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then it was like, yeah, October we're mm -hmm. reopening. We're literally unlocking the doors and mm -hmm. people are going to be in the building for the first time in October, 2021. I'm like, let's, let's have a 
party. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And by then, I felt like one of the things I really needed to work on was collaborating with other artists. Right. And I thought, you know, it it would be so cool if I could somehow form some new connections with other artists, especially after being isolated for a year and a half Mm -hmm. and having thought so much about um, this project. I was just curious, like, how to involve as many people as possible, right. really. And, um, yeah, so that first Weaving Water workshop was was just me. Um, I had just gotten one of those, um, you know, portable fire pits mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that everybody was gathering around outside yep. as, like, a social <laughs> device. Um, so, and it was cold, you know, so it I brought cold. that. We had our little bonfire. We had a couple of tables set up. Mm-hmm. Some people were masked. Everybody was distanced. We were all outside. We were all outside. Mm-hmm. It was a gorgeous day. Mm-hmm. It was so sunny and the sky was so blue. And I had the last harvest of indigo that we had grown that summer. Mm-hmm. And um, I really, at that stage, still had never extracted the indigo or figured out what to do with it. So I just had two garbage bags full of yeah. indigo leaves. But I knew you could use a hammer and like pound with them and do mm-hmm. stuff somehow. So I had a bunch of tea towels and hammers and wooden blocks and people could be doing that in one area. I had indigo vats on tables and people sort of folding and binding their fabric to create patterns. I had vintage textiles. I think I had some doilies and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. All kinds of different things. It was sort of ridiculous the amount of things that I brought, but I just yeah. couldn't decide what to leave out. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll always remember those two sisters, mm-hmm. um, where one was moving to um, Dubai, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. She was moving there to go for a big job, mm-hmm. something in media or something. And the two sisters um, had come as a special going away moment. Yeah. And to remember the Mississippi, she took mm-hmm. her blue little piece of fabric that she dyed in the indigo here, looking right upon the Mississippi River, which we're so lucky this location that MWMO has is right. so amazing. Um, and she took it all the way to Dubai with her and keeps it as a decoration to remind her of the Mississippi yeah. River. And I mm. thought that was so cool. Totally, totally. I just feel like people were so joyful on that day. Like it was really neat that they had all come for this arts experience and they were all really like all sorts of people and all of them very engaged with different projects, all with fiber and with indigo. Um, But there was like this really like deep understanding all of a sudden of like people just want to be together. Like we've been so separated and our particularly local community felt really divided and kind of icky. And so it was just this really like, (gasps) oh, This kind of stuff has so much power. And when we think about all this stuff that we were trying to come back from, pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and all these things, and we're trying to like figure out what new normal is, there like that workshop for me was like, we people need to be together to solve these problems and people need to be together to feel connected and caring for each other, for the river, for the land, for our community as a whole. And so it's funny for me how that one workshop was like, oh, we've got it. Like, we've got it. We've got to keep doing this kind of stuff because it was really powerful. Yeah. I had the same feeling that day. Like, I I think I know what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, people always joke about, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up, even though I'm X number of years (laughs) old right now. But that was a day where I thought, oh, this is the mix Mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I really... um, just felt so privileged to provide that environment, yeah, and um, and to be honored by the presence of you know like people like Amake Kubat came mm-hmm. to that first mm-hmm. one, and it, which I means somebody I really admire and yeah. works in community and does amazing things. Um, I think Beverly Cotman stopped by that. Beverly Cotman did too, and she's a fellow Compass teaching artist mm-hmm. I really admired, and mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so I mean from there we queued up a whole series of weaving water workshops that were free and open mm-hmm. to the public. And I think our first one, I think we only had 20 participants and um, found that, you know, especially as the pandemic issues decreased yeah. and especially for the online one with Abake, mm-hmm. you know, we could have a larger audience. So I think we had 40 and 50 people sometimes yeah. show up yeah. to these events to just 
be together and play and contemplate in some way our connection with water yeah. and our ability to solve problems creatively and our ability to connect mm -hmm. across all kinds of different differences, whether it's age or background or, mm -hmm. cre you know, artisticness right. or whatever it was. Right. And, and to have fun together, you mm -hmm. know, it was like so much work just to survive. Yep. Uh, and, and it is so much work just to survive for lots of people all the time, all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't create spaces where our bodies can relax, our nervous systems can kind of downshift and allow us to connect and use that, you know, mammalian <laughs> prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. where all our creativity and connection comes from, where our problem solving comes from. I mean, this is really yeah. important work. To be able to do, and it seems there's fewer and fewer places to do that um, in society, you know, even workplaces are different. Mm -hmm. You don't go to work yeah, to be with people different. necessarily. Right. right. A lot of people are at home. Your only connection with others is through very structured online interactions and things like that. And so, yeah, just that sort of more relaxed, informal way of being together feels really important. And I think that it's really important for people to to be able to be engaged in understanding the work that the watershed does mm -hmm. and caring enough about the river to vote to continue right. <laughs> funding places like this um, to, you know, maybe get curious enough that you want to even do some kind of river cleanup or mm -hmm. water monitoring, citizen science. Um, you know, you have to have that opportunity and that emotional connection to begin with. Right or you've got nothing to work with. Right. And to me, that's really, I mean, even before all of the, uh, uh, um, the we, uh, excuse me, before I did the botanical screen printing stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, that was, I had gone to an environmental education conference because I thought, well, maybe that's what I need to go back into now. Yeah. And the presenter was talking about how there was this big downturn since um, climate change became such a concrete issue. Mm -hmm. Um in people going into environmental science. Like a lot of young people just weren't going into it yeah. because frankly, the presenter said, it's like a Debbie Downer, you know? <laughs> it's right. really like such a depressing topic. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is, that is something I can do something about. Yeah. Because I really feel like I'm kind of a cheerleader for nature in some mm -hmm. ways. Like my enthusiasm about observing nature, noticing ripples in water, edges of leaves, whatever those things are, it lights up all my faculties. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I just am excited about it. And I love to share that with other people. Yeah. And if that's what I have to bring, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, the scientific end all be all perfect way to solve every problem, mm -hmm. then I'm going to have to be, a, I'm just going to have to be happy doing that. Or, you know, I'm going to have to see that as something that's valuable Yeah. because I can't wait around for the big solution mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, you know, going to solve all our problems at once. It doesn't exist right. in anything right. <laughs> as it turns out. And really it's all of these small incremental pieces. And you know that I've done this message as well yeah. with the, mm -hmm. um, how does, how does a fiber become a thread and a thread become mm -hmm. a fabric? You know, mm -hmm. most people, if they've even ever seen raw wool or cotton, don't understand that you can't just, you know, wear it right. <laughs> as is. You have to do a lot of transforming of it mm -hmm. that involves those fibers twisting and holding together by friction. Mm -hmm. And it's that tension that is introduced in those fibers that allows them to be strong. Yeah. And that it's a lot of small, weak fibers that build one big, strong thread. Mm -hmm. And, you know... To me, I mean, I, I'm also a sucker for metaphors. Yeah. You know? I was just going to say, you spend a lot of time in your workshops kind of weaving meta, we, weaving metaphor throughout the kind of your introduction to things and why we're here and that sort of thing. And I think it's super, um, it just, it like people hear that and it makes sense and also, um, they get to do it. So like that, everything that you just described about the tension, creating the cloth, creating the thread and then creating the cloth, like that stuff starts to feel more like, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. And they can understand how the metaphor relates to the way that we work as a community to 
try to, or the way we would like to work as a community to try to care for the river. Right. That it's not just any one person's job. Right. It's, it's everybody's little bit. Yeah. And it's all these different intricate pieces. The first year of the Weaving Water Workshops in your residency, we did all of our workshops here on site at the MWMO and then um, decided to kind of shift gears a little bit because we were, they were super popular. We were filling everyone with a waiting list and it was great. And we were seeing a lot of people returning and, um, and that program was going really well. But we were realizing that there were people who were missing out on your workshops um, for various reasons. Some of them being just unfamiliar with this location or inability to travel or just not even knowing that they were an option. Um, and as a organization, it's important for us to figure out how to really connect with everybody who lives, works, and plays in our watershed. So we started having you take your show on the road and um, start to try to connect with some of the audiences that we hadn't had great success in engaging in our work in the past. Um, so anyway, so for the last year and a half or so, you've been working kind of in that more like pop-up and working with community organizations realm to get your workshops and your work and your um, experiences out into the community. So I would love if you can talk a little bit about how or why you think Weaving Water Workshops are such a powerful way to connect people who might not otherwise connect with the MWMO's work. Well, um, yeah, it's been really fun to take weaving water on the road mm -hmm. um, to the south side mm -hmm. and uh, really um, place, you know, where I live. Yeah. <laughs> and But also I found that it's sort of the next level after collaborating with, um, with other artists as guest presenters here at MWMO was to find p organizations that could benefit you know, there could be some kind of a mutual benefit going on. Yeah. You know, I'm able to, weaving and indigo are messes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they involve equipment most people don't have. They're also a really unique experience and really fun. And there's sort of a high level of curiosity right now mm -hmm. about natural dyes. And, you know, it's sort of a slam dunk in a way. People yeah. will come out of the woodwork to find out about indigo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... um and it's also really neat. I mean, we haven't even stated the obvious, which obviously the blue of the indigo sort of references the blue of the water. Yes. <laughs> um, it's all very watery. It's all very watery looking after you weave it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, for organizations um, that are looking to engage their audiences in new ways mm -hmm. um, that don't cost anything. You yeah. know, it's an amazing thing that the, the watershed can fund me to bring the workshop mm -hmm. and um, present this to a community of people and even provide some funding for the staff as they work with us yeah. to provide this to communities. And in that way, the connections are just so much more authentic mm -hmm. and natural and welcoming because you can't be friends with everybody mm -hmm. when you're an government organization. Right. You know, and the fact of the matter is people gather already naturally all around the city at all different levels for lots of different reasons. Yep. And um, and the people that are are creating those gathering spaces hold such enormous social knowledge and power and um, credibility, right. you know? It's really, you know, we've joked before about Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. As a name, you sort of fall asleep before you get to the end of the last <laughs> syllable. <laughs> right. <laughs> and on top of it, most people have no clue what a watershed is. Yeah. You know, we all learn about landforms like um, mountains, rivers, mm -hmm. whatever. But we, if you were to conjure a, a image of a watershed, what would that look like? I don't think most people have like an immediate visual. Right. And you know, one of the amazing things about the Mississippi River is that it literally connects us here in Minnesota mm -hmm. to people in Ohio mm -hmm. and Montana and all the way, of course, down to Louisiana and the Gulf. Right. It's the fourth largest watershed in the world. Right. Do people know this? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some do, but a lot don't. <laughs> you know, it's monumental. Yeah. And to know that you live in a really special global globally significant land feature, yeah. I think is worth celebrating and talking about. At the very least, being aware of, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but 
you know, if you can't visualize the thing in the first place, you can't contextualize like, oh, it's the biggest one, who cares, yeah. or the fourth biggest. But um, so a lot of, you know, and I think especially for people that cross the river daily, mm -hmm. you know, you can unsee things. For sure. Because you just filter them out. And it's really hard to be in direct contact with the river. Mm -hmm. There's few opportunities, especially on the north side up here, um, for people to physically even touch the river. Right. You know, most people aren't swimming in the river. You have some people doing some boating activities, mm -hmm. but for the most part, everybody's driving over the river. Right. Or running or biking. Um, and so for us to come together and just appreciate, for instance, at Mudluck Pottery, mm -hmm. where we had uh, the first off-site weaving water workshop, and a big thank you to those guys over mm -hmm. there. They were just starting up last spring, and such a cool community pottery space Yeah, um, right there at Bloomington and Lake Street. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, that's a mile from the river. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really pretty close. Right. And of course, clay has an association with the earth. That's where mm -hmm. it comes from. And so the conversation points are there. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's fun. It's mm -hmm. fun to celebrate connection. Yeah. And it's important too. And so um, we sort of combined, um, you know, I, I brought the indigo vats and it, since you can't really dye clay mm -hmm. and also, you know, it was only a two hour workshop. We did a macrame project that you know, conceivably you could put a flower pot into the macrame plant holder. Yeah. And then people, so we learned a little bit about knots and the connection of knots to textiles and water and mm -hmm. carrying things. And again, you know, the human ingenuity of here's two fibers. What if I do this to them? Yeah. Now I've got a bag yeah. or I've got, you know, something strong uh, to, to pull something with. Um and to just marvel over those things and have fun creating together and then to like witness the excitement of the indigo process. You know, when you dip it in and you pull it out and it's looking yellow, then it's looking green. It's finally turning blue before your very eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just really fun. And most people haven't had those experiences. And as a um, facilitator, you know, my role is really just a lot of kind of connecting around with people and sort of looking for openings to share information mm -hmm. <laughs> or to, um, you know, connect with other people's experiences, you know, and, and to create at least a feeling of welcomeness into this organization that's so unique mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of hard to get your mind around because the name, because watersheds, because, right. because. Right. And yet here we are in Minneapolis and in this metro region where we're so lucky to have watershed management organizations. Yeah. You know, that this is something that taxpayers are paying for and mm -hmm. don't necessarily have a way to understand yeah. or connect directly with. Yeah. And yet are incredibly important, especially as we continue to have these storm events mm -hmm. <laughs> that are so unpredictable, yeah. you know, and can be really scary. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I've driven through water, um, you know, underneath that one bridge, I can't remember if it's on 31st or whatever, the south side. There's one place where there's mm -hmm. a low spot mm -hmm. sometimes if, it, if we have a real bad rain. Yeah. But to understand how stormwater pipe systems are not something people usually sit around chewing the fat about at dinner. Yeah. yeah. But that the, the less water we allow to go into those systems, mm -hmm. the more capacity they have to help us manage big storm events. Yeah. Like... That's really important. It's as important as having, you know, a good sewer system, which is, of course, separate from the stormwater system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. luckily. Right. Um, but, um, and how really ultimately, I think the other thing that I find really inspiring about working with the watershed and being here by the Mississippi is that it's a success story, environmentally speaking. Yeah. You know, we're n yeah. next year or two is the 100-year anniversary of the river being declared dead. Yes. Yes. I mean, that is so grim. Yes. But, you know, one of the first things I learned um, when I went to something I think Shanai put together on the mm -hmm. river, on the on the boat, was how the river was literally just an open sewer. Yeah. For years and years. Into the until 70s. The, until the Clean Water Act, yeah. In my lifetime, mm -hmm. you know. And that in my lifetime, the river's gone from revolting mm -hmm. to this treasure that we have in our midst. And right. are we aware of it? Right. And so it's really a, a powerful thing to just, you know, 
work on those, um, the ability of being aware mm-hmm. and, and, and creating experiences with the river yeah. that help us feel that it's a part of our lives, yep. you know, versus something you're driving over and is ultimately ignorable, you yeah. know? Yeah. I don't know really how anybody can ignore the river. I'm looking out the window here <laughs> just going, <sighs> I know. It's amazing. But I agree. And as a person who's lived a lot of my life here, I totally see or can understand how easy it is to just, it's just there. And so you don't really think about it very much. And I certainly encounter people in our outreach work who just don't have much sense for it because it's just here. They're not thinking about it. And it's whatever, just like a street that you cross all the time. Um, But I I also think that story about how much, particularly since the implementation of the Clean Water Act, that the water quality has recovered and uh, a lot of our wildlife have returned and that sort of thing is an important one to share with people in general. Um, Because I think it's helpful for people to really understand that we can make, we can change things in a positive way. Because I think there's a lot of fatalism around environmental stuff Mm -hmm. in general, because we just feel like, oh, it's too big. Like we can't, we're too far in it. We can't reverse it. Um, So I think sharing that story about how far we've come with the river is really important. And that's kind of off topic, but it's it's an important thing to share. And one of the things that I think when I have observed um, some of the workshops that you've done out in the community in partnership with other organizations is how you don't do any like direct instruction really about our connection with the river or stormwater or the ways that the water gets, the river water is polluted, but people come away, like because of the way that the conversations go and little things that they talk about with each other or they hear from you or from me, um, people often make comments as they're leaving workshops where you're like, whoa, you really understand a lot suddenly about our you know, problems with stormwater runoff and the reasons that the MWMO at least is trying hard to capture that and filter pollutants and all that kind of, like it's amazing how much, it's just a different way of sharing information than what we think about as like the typical sort of teaching model of here's the watershed, this is what the definition of a watershed is, this is why stormwater is important, here's the pollutants, this is what happens to the river, this is how we stop it. You know, like I think particularly for me with an education background, an interesting way, but like still like just sharing, conveying that information is a big part of what we do. And so being able to see you and the way that you still are able to kind of facilitate this experience where people learn a lot of that stuff, just not in the way that traditional educators would teach it um, is really cool. So I'm curious um, about how this experience of doing Weaving Water being our Um, artists and residents here at the MWMO, working on site, going out into the community, how this has changed or influenced kind of your practice as an artist, as a teaching artist, as a scientist? Well, first of all, thanks for for the high compliment. (laughs) I really appreciate it. Um, You know, one of the, the the reason that I kind of chickened out on art in the first go around Mm -hmm. in the mid 90s was that it just seemed kind of an impossible path. Um, You know, like I said, I'm pretty averse to stress. I just, you know, I, most people are, Mm -hmm. but you know, most of us learn how to really put up with a lot. I I just simply have to monitor that for myself. But, um, and you know, the pandemic sort of threw a wrench in things because I intended to sort of be where I am now four years ago. But as we've learned together, that mm-hmm. you cannot necessarily plan the future. You no. just have to be prepared to receive the future yeah. and be ready to respond with the future. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the thing about grants is that often you're proposing something that you don't know if you can do or not for another year. Right. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to build your life around that, build your career, count on income. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much hustling involved. And um, and to find a place where my work has a steady use mm-hmm. and, and yet have all of this expansive opportunity as well is really amazing. Like, yeah. I mean, just the support and the stability that I've gotten 
as an artist in residence here at Mississippi Watershed and working with you, Abby, specifically. I mean, it's not just anyone, I think, that could necessarily have, you know, we, we, we got lucky with our synergy. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, but that's allowed me to just calm myself down so much and to realize that so much of the work I've already done mm -hmm. has yards of use, use left, you know. Right. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but it just has, you know, there's plenty of use left in my art projects. I don't have to skip on to the next brilliant idea, so to speak, right. and abandon this because I, quote, already did that. You know, I think that this is my life's work now, that mm -hmm. helping organizations find a way to connect with their audiences who, you know, are changing constantly, not only because people are moving more, but because people are busier, mm -hmm. you know? It's really hard to count on a bunch of, uh, you know, regular volunteers even. Right. In fact, when we open up the Weaving Water workshops, we always open it up to twice as many tickets as we know we, you know, people will show up mm -hmm. because things come up in life. It's just right. a known quantity now. Mm -hmm. It's not even a known quantity. It's an unknown quantity, but it happens. And so um, it's sort of this last iteration of using my art for a purpose mm -hmm. um, and getting to really see its results in the faces of people and in emails and right. comments um, and opportunities um, makes me realize that there's something to this, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool because as it turns out, <laughs> this is a national trend. Yeah. Yeah. It is really bubbling up. And yeah. we have some leadership in the, the Twin Cities of other artists, environmentalists like Amanda Lovely, mm -hmm. who are um, helping bring this artist in residence model to all kinds of, you know, civic organizations right. that can benefit from having an artist but might not have a clue how to work with an artist, mm -hmm. or to help artists who might not have a clue about how to work in sort of a more formal setting in a way. Right. You know, I think I have this background that was just the right mix of you know, I've got enough science background that I can talk about all these natural science topics and understand the science behind what the issues are. Mm -hmm. um, it all fits pretty quickly for me. And, and then I've also worked in different kinds of environments that are, you know, like working for a construction company was actually really useful because yeah, everything's sure. project-based, right. you know? And, you know, that every contributor to a project there's a fee associated with that, mm -hmm. and there's a value delivered with right. that fee. And so often in the arts, it's really hard to define what the value is or what the, quote, product is mm -hmm. or what the outcome is. You know, we're really very outcome-based right. um, in our society. And yet the outcome is the least important thing mm -hmm. in some ways mm -hmm. because what you're trying to do is develop a system of connection that is the product. It's not the thing you're looking at on the wall. It's the fact that there is a live connection, a warm connection yeah. with other people that know who to call, know what the work is that you do, can explain what you're doing to other people in their community, mm -hmm. can help expand a sense of um, trust <laughs> around the process that you are responsible for, you know, at the watershed. Um, you know, I think it's amazing. We've got environmental rules that say, try to keep your water on your own property and have it fil you know, filter down through the soil. Right. That's the best way for water to find its way to the river. It takes longer, it gets filtered along the way. But of course, you know, most water and precipitation in the, in the city falls on pavement right. <laughs> and makes its way to the river very quickly, gathering all the debris mm -hmm. and all the pollution along the way and just dumping it straight in because yeah. there's no filter at the end of that drain pipe right. that dumps into the river. Right. I mean, at least there's a filter now for the sewage part of it. <laughs> but, you know, we still have a long way to go. And, I mean, even with the salt, understanding, like, even the eco-salt, all salt is pollution. Right. Once you put a tablespoon of salt into a five-gallon bucket. A teaspoon. Oh, sorry, a teaspoon. Oh, yeah. my gosh. A teaspoon of salt in a yeah. five-gallon bucket. That's permanently polluted. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if it wasn't, we would all have endless fresh drinking water because we would just desalinate the ocean right. or whatever, we you know? just drink it. Yeah. We'd just drink the ocean. <laughs> but, you know, these are concepts that are just, it's, there's so much competing for our brain space all the time. Right. The, some of these things that really boil down to our basic sur survival, mm -hmm. we don't have a mechanism to understand yeah. or a setting to contemplate it in. Yeah. And... Um, and I love that the, the watershed, these management organizations, you guys in Capital Region, the whole purpose is to help people who are building on top of the land in mm -hmm. urban environments do a better job with the stormwater. Yes. To have less of it go over the concrete and more of it into the soil. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, that your whole purpose is to help people go above and beyond the required. Right baseline right that's so cool right and we voted for it yeah and my tax dollars are paid for it. i think that's so cool so um you know one of the things i was thinking about earlier you had asked me what does weaving what you know what is weaving water mm -hmm. and where it comes from and i had mentioned you know i like alliteration but also i was really thinking about how um you know the Mississippi River for me was the stuff of storybooks growing mm -hmm. up. It seemed so far away. And the whole idea of a mm -hmm. braided river, you know, the rivers in the Northwest are often coming down off the mountain. Right. You know, there's some gravity involved in the whole thing. But this long, long river that went from the top of the U.S. to the bottom mm -hmm. um, and how it changed shape along the way and, you know, really captured my imagination growing up. Um, but beyond that, I didn't have any concept of it. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I guess that's sort of an aside other than the braiding of the river, of course, right. is a textile-related right. <laughs> notion. But the weaving water idea is, you know, when you look at two streams coming together, often you get those kind of diamond-shaped patterns where mm -hmm. the two streams are intersecting. Yep. And then it disappears mm -hmm. until the next two come together. And then that disappears. And it, it looks woven. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not something that stays. Right. But it's also not something that's without significance, mm -hmm. you know? There's, you know, water mixing from two different streams there yeah. and yeah. then traveling downstream. Yeah. And when I think about our experience working together, um, just presenting weaving water workshops, mm -hmm. um, it's been a lot about cherishing that brief intersection yeah. and not worrying that we've got everything figured out mm -hmm. for eternity because... Right. I think by now we can accept that that's not a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's about this moment-to-moment -moment situation of people coming together, intersecting, you know, of people intersecting with the river yeah. in, an, in a deeply impactful way that will carry results downstream. And you can't quantify those, mm -hmm. but you can see the difference in audience participation yeah. or people knowing that you exist right. or people talking about the river. And, you know, like that, um, that study that was done recently about attitudes about the Mississippi watershed mm -hmm. at the school of you know, school of journalism at Missouri, I think. Yep, that's right. Ag um, water desk. I think it the is. ag water desk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, was talking about people really rely on what their neighbors have to say. Yes. And so it's really that important that each of us, find a way towards some kind of self-education, mm -hmm. some kind of direct experience, um, trying something that might seem too complicated or that we're unqualified for, mm -hmm. but giving it a go, yeah. and seeing what comes of that. And seeing, more importantly, what comes of the process of doing that. Yeah. So, and, and that's what, to me, is ultimately so rewarding about the Weaving Water project is mm -hmm. that it's not really about me as an artist presenting some perfectly beautiful, brilliant something or other. Mm -hmm. It's really about facilitating an environment for people to connect, to share ideas, to um, question, you know, to ask questions yeah. in a really safe way. Um, and to draw on their own kind of personal watersheds mm -hmm. of creativity and knowledge. You know, all of us have you know, ancestry and life experience and, um, you know, friend groups and people that, you know, these ideas ultimately meet in each of us. Yeah. And then when we intersect with the next person, 
they mix and go out into the world again. And so I just think, um, you know, as we try to continue forth on healing, mm -hmm. you know, over and over and over again, you know, healing is a, yeah. is a process too. Yeah. From all of these stressors, from climate change, from, you know, just social mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. um, that when we come together and we give it a go and we swap ideas, like I love to watch when people are explaining how to do something, this is how you twist the wool better. Mm. Here, you hold that oh, in. Sure. No, you know, yeah. and people explain to each it. other. Yeah. I haven't told them necessarily exactly right. what the steps are, but people figure out the steps because people are smart. Right. And so capable. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that to me is so much hope about our future on this planet, um, you know, just the lifespan that you have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the future generations that are going to be here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just hope that we can all continue intersecting, yeah. <laughs> taking what we can from each other gratefully and, and going out and then sharing that again and being excited about the process and where we can go next with it. And instead of always having this focus that we have, it's nothing's worth it if you don't solve it mm -hmm. once and for all. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's just beyond our capacity in our lifetimes, yeah. necessarily. We are all these little wimpy fibers along the, the history of humanity really stretching back mm -hmm. um, to eternity. Right. You know? right. um, but each of us does have so much power to bring and to share with other people. For sure. And, um, and it blew me away. I told you I was just teaching a, a class at MCAT, and mm -hmm. one of the students came up and said she'd come to my weaving water workshop, and that what we had done with the fiber and the indigo and mm -hmm. the process and the community work really changed her outlook and her life mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. As an artist. Which is probably like the best compliment you can get, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else there is <laughs> right. that, that can make you feel like a successful human. Yeah. But then to help another human. Right. right. Um, That's great. So. And so. It, it's so exciting to have looked at that classroom and, and be able to tell those kids, I mean, well, but, well to be able to tell those students that there's some, <laughs> there's some exciting growth in the arts mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. so to speak. That, you know, this modality of being able to be a creative person in an institution yeah. and to use your skills as an artist to help that institution tell its story, connect with people, mm -hmm. um, help the audience be educated mm -hmm. and knowledgeable and impactful about whatever the given subject is is so exciting. Yeah. And so, you know, the Healing Bridging Th Thriving Summit is was the name of the, the summit they just had in D.C. in January. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and this is all, I think, in response also to the Surgeon General's um, report on the epidemic of loneliness. Yep. So it all ends up mixed, you know. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm here excited about the Mississippi River. I want people to know about it. I want people to know that the Watershed Management Organization is rocking it in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can get into water chemistry and yes, we can get into stormwater systems. But ultimately, this is all about how we connect with nature and how we connect with each other. Yes. That's awesome. do you think? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a great place to wrap it up. So... Thank you, Sarah, for being here and sharing your story and your experience with us and kicking off our River of Ideas podcast. Um, people who want to know more about how to connect with you um, or with the Weaving Water Workshops can check out our website at mwmo.org, and there's information about how to contact you directly on there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. This has just been a blast. Awesome. <laughs>